Hello, innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today we're talking with Dr. Angela Contalesa, Polymath Evangelist, Researcher, and Founder of Polymath Place. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Podcast. Thank you for having me, Dustin. There's a lot of polymaths in that. Uh, <laughs> a lot of poly there. came out yeah. of your mouth right there. <laughs> there was one day, I don't know what happened, but I literally said poly 20 times in about two or three sentences. <laughs> it was insane. Uh, please say hello I love to the. It. Yeah, thank you. Please say hello to the innovators in the audience. Hi, innovators. Thanks for watching us. So we're here to talk about her dissertation on polymathy as well as her polymath life. The way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. That nobody knows. You know, here's something I have never mentioned publicly. I was so committed to trying lots of things when I was 18 and off at college that I got my tongue pierced just to try something outside yeah. the box. Yeah. So during my undergrad, my tongue was pierced. And then when I graduated, I took it out and no scars or anything. But, you know, I really, I like the idea of just going with the flow and being daring and trying new things within, within reason, yeah. right? But, being mindful, but still. <laughs> yeah, but now here I am, Dr. Cotalesa. You know, I kind of like the idea that like, I could be Dr. Cotalesa who worked for several presidents and has mm -hmm. a doctorate, of course. And, I had my tongue pierced too. Well, and I don't think that's too big of a deal. It's just one of those things you had to experiment. You talk about in dissertation experiential uh, and just uh, learning and being able to do things and experimenting with that too. So, Yeah. A friend dared me to get something pierced and I thought, well, I don't want any scars on my face. My ears <laughs> are already pierced. So I guess I'll try that. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. And then before you started all of this polymathy stuff, what was your mindset? Before I started the polymath stuff, like what led into it? Yeah. I, I try to take it open-minded when I ask that question. Yeah. Well, I really want to live a good life myself. Mm -hmm. And the way that that shows up for me is trying lots of things, getting really good at things I try, making an impact, hopefully helping other people, being authentic to who I am. And so for me, polymathy kind of is a way of, it's a term that embraces those kinds of values because it, it basically means you want to learn and try lots of things. You want to be all in. That's a kind of way that I describe polymathy is like being all in at life. And so what led me to study polymathy was I thought, I want to study the kind of people that I want to be when I grow up, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what led me to it. It's interesting. And it's funny how you mentioned all in because I've literally been on two podcasts that were called all in. And it's wow. kind of like a business idea as well, where you're going all in on that endeavor, <clears throat> you're trying to execute on it. But I think that polymathy fits in there as well quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea is you're not kind of holding back or fitting into a yeah. box or fitting into a mold because there's societal pressure or parental pressure or whatever. Like, I like the idea of creating my own path, of owning and writing my own story. That is what I feel like I am here to do, is to express who I really am and to have fun along the way and to learn and to contribute. And that's what polymaths do, you mm -hmm. know? So I, I think it's a great way of living. I'm obviously, I should just state this at the beginning. Yes, I'm a scholar. Yes, I was in academia. I am completely biased and mm -hmm. pro-polymathy too. It's perfect so. for this show, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> Well, and it's interesting. I created Poly Innovator for that exact reason to curate my co potential careers in my life because I knew I was going to have many. Well, let's figure out which ones I need to have first and which ones are going to work best and which ones are going to be most interesting at this time and be able to switch on hand too if I feel like it. Yeah, I love the word you use, curate, mm. even more than create. Because create, and this is a word I use frequently when I'm talking about this stuff. Create is like, I could create something in my reality that I had no intention to create. Like mm -hmm. I could create an illness. I could create a broken bone, you know, like, yeah. but curate means I put some thought and some intention behind designing my own experience. And I love this idea of not just being a passive recipient of my life experience, but owning it and driving it and writing it, mm -hmm. curating it. So I love that you use, use that word. Perfect. And digging into the questions here, then something I ask all my guests, but I never ask first, but I was mentioning to you beforehand, I think it's best to ask this first. What is a polymath to you? I'm going to give you two parts to that. I'm going to give you my off the cuff 
what comes to mind. And then I'm going to read you what I think is the best definition that exists in academia so far by Robert Ruth Bernstein. Sounds okay. good. So what is a polymath? Well, it has nothing to do with mathematics. Yeah. If someone's new to the word, it, it basically means many learnings. Math is short for Manthanin in Greek, which means to learn or learning. So it's someone who's learned a lot even though we live in an age of specialization where we're told, no, don't learn about a wide breadth of things. Oh, no, don't do that. Become very narrow and specialized in one area and do that. And then we'll reward you and we'll make you prestigious and you'll have lots of money. So at, the, at a high level, it's someone who has chosen breadth and depth in their personhood, especially with what they learn, but also to some extent with what they experience, rather than restriction, which is what we're told to do by society. Mm -hmm. So it requires some amount of like rebelliousness, curiosity, bravery. There's some, some layers that have to, you know, underneath all of that involved with being a polymath in the current time anyway. Now, Robert Root Bernstein, who I consider, Bob, if you're watching this, I don't know if I've told you this, but I consider Robert Root Bernstein kind of like my intellectual father because he and I have presented at several conferences and are in touch fairly regularly. I have a great deal of respect for him. And he, in my mind, started and gave birth to the field of polymath studies, which, oh, by the way, is concerningly small. Yeah. There are not many scholars. And by the way, can I just go on down that tangent before yeah, I read this? Yeah, yeah. I just want to point out, <laughs> Bob and I, and anyone else in academia who is studying polymathy is a rebel. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when you are in academia is the higher up you go, especially at the doctoral level, what you are expected to do is become highly specialized, <clears throat> like super specialized in one little thing. That's what it means, you know, to like to become a doctor in something is you, you need to specialize very narrowly. And what I chose to do is to and Bob and, and a few others is in the environment of academia where where specialization is highly prized hyper specialization is rewarded is we chose to become specialized about not being specialized <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I just want to point that out I it, it was a statement to academia and the academic institutions and the academic world for me to write a dissertation, to, to become highly specialized in not being highly specialized. And by the way, as far as I'm aware, my dissertation was the first and only doctoral level, level dissertation on this. So that's the environment that academia has is mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't encourage people to, to become multidisciplinary scholars or to think in polymathic ways. Anyway, I'm blabbering. Let me go back to Bob's definition now. It's quite related so, to what we're talking about later too, so it's good. Oh, good, good. So Bob's definition, his uh, sort of working definition, is that polymathy is active engagement, and that means like you're actively doing things, not passively, in multiple interests or endeavors, integrating vocations with avocations, so work and hobbies, simultaneously or serially across the lifespan. And I think that definition, it gets at like four or five different ways of looking at it, you know, the multiple interests or endeavor, active engagement, vocations and avocations simultaneously or serially, and like that it's a life, a lifetime effort. <laughs> so um, I like that definition. I think it's a good start. But I should also say, given how few scholars study polymathy, it's not as if we have an agreed upon definition. And of course, there are people outside of academia who may have their own definitions as well. But the bottom line is they're not narrow specialists. Mm -hmm. They're the opposite of that. Well, and when you're mentioning how there's very little people doing studies on polymathy, but I think that's partially because the, the society and particularly education society basically confines us to that narrow pathway. Because yeah. of that, we don't want to go down that path. At least only like half or a third of your research uh, researchees that you were doing in your study were basically self-taught for the most part. A lot of them had master's degrees. A lot of them did have college education, but a lot of them still focus more on self-education to teach themselves. Absolutely. Self-directed learning is huge and lifelong 
self-directed learning is huge for polymath. Yeah. But I was also thinking, why is that? Like, why do we have, I mean, granted, I know why we are curious that that's one reason, but why is it that we can't have traditional education that is like what we want to do? And that's one reason why we that should. Me. Yeah. That's my point. We should. Yeah. yeah it's entirely we possible. I mean, one of the things I hope that my dissertation could help with is to start a dialogue in the education system about what education could look like mm -hmm. to elicit polymathic thinking and ways of being in more people, knowing that there are great rewards and strengths that polymaths can bring to the table. So right now, our education system, especially, well, no, probably at pretty much at all levels, mm -hmm. is you go to school and somebody else tells you what you're going to learn. It, there's a book I read by Freire, and he called it banking education. He was like, I'm going to deposit this information into your brain. <laughs> like, it's like going to the bank and putting in money. And ew, who wants yeah. that? Like, don't you want to decide like what your input is? Choice. So it's entirely possible that we could re-engineer our school systems so that teachers aren't depositing information. They're supporting someone's self-exploration mm -hmm. to follow their own curiosities. And with the internet, and I mean, it's just so easy to teach yourself and follow your own questions. Um, and so it's entirely possible we could redesign schools to support self-directed learning instead of this kind of banking education. So you didn't get a chance to really look over the questions here. One of which is actually mm -hmm. about my endeavor called the modular degree, where I literally do just that, where I'm trying yeah. to change how we approach education through uh, self-curated learning. So I created yeah. this mod degree to be a new way of approaching education in the modern age. And one of the biggest factors was I wanted to make it for polymaths. Yeah. Sure, there's people who want to pivot careers or they want an alternative to college. But a lot of those people who want an alternative are polymathic people. And so what... And plus, this also helps with lifelong learning in general, too. What do you yeah. think would be some key principles or concepts to apply to that self-curated education degree? I think some of the key concepts would be that the individual learner would get to decide what they want to learn about, but they would have support. It's not as if they would be off on an island by themselves. Yeah. You know, they could still learn from a mentor. They could learn from an expert, a specialist. They could learn from um, a coach or a parent or a teacher. Like it's not as if self-directed learning means, oh, you're just on your own and good luck. Mm -hmm. What it means is that I get to decide the direction I'm headed and then I get some support, you know, like maybe the, the teacher or facilitator would recommend some possible books for me to consider or some people for me to interview or some experiences that might help me learn about that particular area I'm curious about. But the onus for what I'm learning would be on me. And I don't have data to back this up, but I just feel intuitively like my retention for something I'm learning is going to be so much higher if I want to learn it. Yeah. <laughs> if you try to teach me what's something I'm not interested in. Calculus or something. If you try, I mean, I took calculus in high school and I hated it. So that's a great example, Dustin. If you force me to learn calculus, I can struggle through it. I, I, I remember one or two things from a calculus class in 1998 or 99. Like, I don't remember calculus. I, I just don't. And I didn't want to learn it. Yeah. I did it to impress my uh, future college yeah. that I could do it. Um, and so the point here is, though, that if we want people to actually retain what they're learning, what they're spending time and energy investing into learning. We're going to get so much of a better payoff if they're learning about something that they want to learn about rather than forcing them to follow some prescription that who knows, I mean, who even decided like what we have to learn. I mean, it's, it's a whole system, I guess, but um, so yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think that this modular degree aspect is cool because sure, it's self-curated. So I think at first you're kind of on an island, but I hope to be able to help people with it as well. But I think that a line can get like AI to help you with like, oh, if you like this, you might like this next. So like suggested uh, machine learning, suggested articles or something like that. Yeah. But 
and then also having mentors as well is very yeah important. i love this modular concept with learning and i especially love because okay the reality is getting degrees is arduous and expensive and then a lot of the younger kids are like why am i going to go into debt six mm -hmm. figure debt for a degree that's going to get me an entry level job four years from now maybe if i'm lucky Right. And I still will have to live in my parents' house because I won't make enough money and I'll have a boatload of debt. Like mm -hmm. the new world is not, we need to change our approach to education. And I really like the idea if there were like a university that instead of having buildings and uh, campuses and very expensive assets that basically the students have to pay for. Like, what if there was a way of designing your own learning journey where it wasn't dependent even necessarily on going to a class? Like maybe a class would be part of it, but maybe it would be, I read this, these 10 books and then I yeah. come up, you know, and I get a mentor and I have an experience and I go to a different country and, you know, look at what I just studied in person or whatever it may be. But, we need to change how we think about learning because learning doesn't depend on a classroom. Mm -hmm. Learning doesn't even necessarily depend on a, a teacher. You can teach yourself if you're willing to read and listen and let information come in and then think critically about it too and observe yeah. your own, op, you know, uh, review in a way. reactions to it. So I think there's a real opportunity, especially with technology and especially with the financial concerns we have to rethink what becoming an educated, knowledgeable person looks like and, and how you can get there. And the mm -hmm. old school way is not the only way. Well, and a lot of people think of online education just as MOOCs or courses, and those are great ways of going about it. But like you said, books, if there's 10 books you want to read, maybe it's an encyclopedia. You want that to be your education. You want to find a way yeah. to do it the most effective way possible. That's not boring for the way. But there's like mm -hmm. podcasts, there's audiobooks, there's there's articles, YouTube, YouTube videos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I wanted to be able to find a way to organize all of that. I couldn't find a degree that actually suited me. So I just made my own. That was my motivation. But I know that it also helped because I was able to be polymathic in my education, yeah. choosing between what interested me most. And so I could spend 12 hours one day studying something if I chose to. So I was so yeah. interested in it. And that's what I wanted to inspire. I don't know about traveling as much, but because um, I don't know how the logistically that would be, but everything you have said there is what I'm trying to do with the module degree. So that's yeah. really cool. That's awesome. I feel like this actually aligns a lot with your lesson collector page. So oh, okay. what do you think could come from that <laughs> comparison? Yes, it does actually. And by the way, lesson collector, before I really even finished my dissertation, I was like, I, you know, I, I'm so committed to learning and self-improvement that I came up with this website called lesson collector, which I've done very little with, but the idea was, I had this epiphany one day, I had this epiphany about what I want to do with my life. And I realized, <laughs> I'll tell you the, the truth. I love, this is a little embarrassing, but I'm just going to mm -hmm. be honest. I love scent. I love perfumes. Okay. I have, I'm a collector of women's perfumes. And I was like having this little like conversation in my own head about what do I really want to be a collector of? You know, like I like perfumes, but at the end of the day, I don't want to be known as like a scent collector, even though that, that's nice. But yeah. <laughs> I realized, you know, I want to be a collector of lessons. I want to be a collector of relationships, connection with people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I came up with the, the website name Lesson Collector. And it's very related to polymathy because polymaths are lesson collectors. You know, they're information mm -hmm. hoarders, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, well. <clears throat> yeah. So, and, and anyone who goes and looks at lessoncollector.com, I just have to say, like, it's not a very good website. There's not a whole lot there. <laughs> but the basic concept was, let's all be collectors of lessons. And if, if I guess more largely, the question I want to put out to you guys is, what do you want to be a collector of in your mm -hmm. life? What do you want to collect? It's a good question. And you had an interview on there with C. Joy Bell C. And so I reached yes. out to her after that. That was interesting. It's a really interesting interview. Yeah. She and I both have, she's awesome, Charity. And she's an author and like super successful and has impacted a lot of lives with her writing and a, is a good friend. I really am so grateful to have her in my life. But she and I have the most interesting rabbit hole, spiritual, multiverse, like, 
intellectual playground kind of conversations. We're both super open minded to like the weirdness that exists in our reality here. Yeah, hopefully. And so, yeah, it's it, th That's those cool. were some fun conversations with her. Well, hopefully we get into that a little bit here today, too. And I was already thinking we might have to have you on again so we can talk more about module education and just learning in general. Yeah, I would love to. And then we can go down those rabbit holes as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of going back to your dissertation, too. What are some of the things you hope people to gain from that? You kind of touched on that a bit, but I'm curious more. There are, you know, at the end of the day, I think there are three main areas I want my dissertation to impact. One is the educational system, like we talked about. Like, can we please rethink what education looks like? Right. So we're actually tapping into and harnessing and leveraging the actual human intelligence that exists. Yeah. rather than like having a shallow experience of our own intellect. Right. So, so changing education to allow for more self-directed lifelong learning is, is one impact I would like to see. And, and it wouldn't necessarily be from my dissertation, but, but just in general, that's one change I'd like to see happen in the world. Organizations is the second. I would like to see organizations stop discriminating against people who are not narrow specialists. Because that's what they do. That organizations right. discriminate against people who have not been narrow and specialized. For the most part, there are a few organizations and maybe a few types of positions where, where they don't discriminate. But it, it's it, it's sad to see people with multidisciplinary expertise be passed over. You know, frequently when hiring managers are are picking someone to interview, they just want someone who's done the same thing over and over again, who've yeah. already done the job and that who have been really, really committed to just doing that one little thing like a cog in a machine. Yeah. And and that's really unfortunate because there are so many strengths and new ways of thinking and innovations that can happen when you hire someone who has multi uh, experiences across different functions mm -hmm. and can do analogical thinking and sort of apply lessons and ideas over here from over there to here. So just organizations realizing that like there are two types of positions. There's the types that are appropriate for specialists and there are the types that are not appropriate for specialists because there's way too much complexity and yeah. volatility and the wicked and big, problems, and wicked whatnot. problems, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Um, so, so there's two types, the routine stable ones and the, and the VUCA wicked harsh ones. Mm -hmm. And that once you determine the two types of, jobs that exist within your organization, you accordingly necessarily would hire differently for them. You would hire a narrow specialist for the routine stable work. You would want them to be very, very highly specialized and expert. And for the VUCA wicked harsh problems, <laughs> yeah. if you put a specialist in that role who just wants to do things like they've always been done, they will fail and it will cost the company in, in significant ways. So we need people who are polymathic, who can bring lots of different solutions, who have a broad toolkit to work on difficult problems. And the fact is our world is only getting more and more complex. Mm -hmm. We're only going to need more and more of those types of people for more and more of the VUCA wicked harsh <laughs> types of jobs. Well, and specialists are the most likely to be taken out, so to speak, by automation as well. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, tech really, <laughs> I've given this a lot of thought, like, how is tech going to disrupt the kind of the, the future of work? And what tech is going to do is force us to look at what sort of unique human value can we add, will we add, once the kind of grunt work <laughs> is taken over. I mean, to some extent, it's already taken over, but um, in the future, it'll be even more the case when machines and AI are doing routinized work, like the role of the human intellect is creativity, innovation, mm -hmm. seeing big pictures, making linkages, like that's the unique, and also emotional intelligence too. Like I yeah. have a feeling tech is not gonna be very good at that kind of stuff. So we need to think through this ahead of time. We need to be proactive and like pre predicting what we need so we could start that pipeline rather than just reacting once we have problems that are already here. Mm -hmm. And just to finish, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. were you going to say something? Go. I just wanted to say the third, so education organizations, and then the third area where I would like to see change is just at the individual level, because I just, 
I, in my research, one of the things I heard from, from polymaths in the 21st century is it's actually fairly difficult. Mm -hmm. It's fairly difficult because how do you explain it without sounding like you're bragging? Organizations don't appreciate it. Uh, it's hard to manage time and like juggle lots of things. Um, you know, even in relationships, I mean, there, there are a lot of challenges with choosing to curate your life in a polymathic way, but at the same time, it's really important in my view to be an author of your own story in a way that feels authentic. Right. And that's what polymaths do. And so I hope that more and more polymathic types feel less alone more understood, more appreciated, more integrated and involved in our society more in the future. Yeah. Well, and I think too, we were kind of mentioning, you said something there, cogs in the machine, and that came down from the industrial revolution. And so it's interesting how since then we've had to specialist society norm, but there is this kind of change going on. We're seeing a change in society, partly due to the internet, not quick enough, honestly, but we still hold on to this whole narrative the, from the industrial revolution to become a specialist. What do you think it would take to be more normalized, to be multidisciplinary in society? I think people just need to see the, like, look at the arguments, look at the value, like learn about it. <laughs> yeah. Be open-minded. Yeah. Yes. Read my dissertation and then we'll be good. Okay. <laughs> Actually, there are quite a few books um, besides my, I mean, Range by David Epstein is really and good Bukwasa one. Bukwasa Med's The Polymath. Um, actually, Peter Burke just released The Polymath. Oh, I wonder what else coming out. Yeah, it just came out like a week or two ago. Um, and he's a, a Cambridge scholar. Who, yeah. So there's some really good texts that have just come out. My dissertation was written in 2018. Um, and I feel a shift, like several books coming out in pop culture, my dissertation, um, my show, your, your show. I mean, <laughs> there just seems to be something happening in humanity where like these, these different, uh, agents mm -hmm. are somehow independently all sort of trending in the same direction, being, uh, thought leaders really yeah. in, in this area. And it just feels like isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that just all of a sudden around the same time, yeah, more of us are, are sort of creeping out there and, and emphasizing this. Isn't that interesting? So this leads me to my next question, actually. I've come across various tribes of polymathic people, in, such as your own polymath place or yep. Michael Barnathan's Project Polymath or Eric Wallace's Polymath Playground and more. And I'm trying to go through Poly Innovator and create this kind of tribe community for all of them to come together because i yeah. want to put everybody under one roof because even your tri tribe you have a few hundred people mine is less than 100 people so many people are on the same either one of our numbers and so like why don't we go together and build it all into one system so that that we can innovate together so yeah. what would it take to accomplish something like that do you think <clears throat> i've had similar thoughts dustin but you are more than welcome to take the lead one of the things i had thought of doing and I, I still need to make my polymassplace.com website. I bought the domain. Yes, I saw the just... website. It's a, a <laughs> stock like, page. It's is like there a like template. a picture of a plant there or something? A cup of um, I think it got updated whenever WordPress got updated. <laughs> yeah, I, I bought the domain name and I need to build the website. But one of the things I had thought of doing there, and I think this may be a little bit different than what you envisioned, but I would like to have like a central clearinghouse where someone can go and see all the resources where they could see like Project Polymath, Polymath Playground, Poly Innovators, like Putty Tribe, just a listing of what resources are out there so that each person can sort of decide for themselves where they think they fit. Um, Cause each of us I think is gonna have a different flavor. Like mm -hmm. Emily Wapnick's Putty Tribe is gonna have yeah. a very, very different flavor than a mine will. Um, and so just having a, a central listing even of what, what resources are out there, what books are out there, what YouTube channels are out there, what podcasts are out there right. is something I had thought of doing just not to necessarily promote any of them but just so polymaths can go okay they here are my options mm -hmm. let me explore and see where i think i fit 
That's interesting. I didn't think about the kind of like a central page, so to speak, but I did mention to you before the show that I'm working on this polymath spectrum and I'm creating a mini series of my Omni content, which is like my main series that I do besides the interviews and these like a seven episode long thing. The problem was I was like, I started researching and I kept researching so much. I was going through hundreds of tabs of great articles and podcasts and I'm very happy I did. I learned a whole bunch. I already knew a lot in in these areas, but Mm -hmm. I still learned so much more. I was so surprised how little I did know in this space, but I think I have a good feeling now for all the polymathic content online. Like I've probably seen at least 75, 80% of it. And what I'm doing is for each of the posts, I'm leaving the links to what I've looked at. And on the final post, I'm going to put, try to put all of them, which is going to be insane. I'll have to find some way to organize <laughs> it well. But essentially speaking, that way people can look at the same things I did and get kind of some similar ideas. Yeah, keeping track of it all. And, you know, from an academic perspective as well, there are a number of authors and thinkers who have written about this in a sort of scholarly way. It's very limited. Um, but even just having, like, what research has been done, what theories have been proposed, what frameworks have been put together in academia, sort of supported by, you know, the academic literature, even just having a list of the scholars and their articles Mm -hmm. would, uh, would also be helpful, I think, too. Yeah, I would definitely like to try to help people with that. That's an interesting idea to go about. And so it kind of leads me to another question here. What is a research study in this area that you wish has, would be done? Like even after yours, so to speak, maybe a sequel to yours Mm. in a way. Oh God, there's so many. List them all. There we go. Let's do it. (laughs) You know, just to be perfectly honest, I tout and speak and think that being polymathic does lead to more innovations, Mm -hmm. does lead to more creativity, does lead to more analogical thinking and linkages and applications. But nobody's measured it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's tested that theory. It intuitively, we just feel like, well, of course, if you have a lot of experiences and lots of tools in your toolkit, like, of course, you're going to be more creative. But, um, Nobody has done that. I'd also like to see, you know, one of the weaknesses, and it's it's kind of a weakness and a strength at the same time, is, well, h- how do you know someone's a polymath? Mm-hmm. And, like, your, your point that it exists on a spectrum is absolutely true. You do not have to be Leonardo da Vinci to consider yourself to be a polymathic person. Right. There's a range, you know, of, of how how much breadth and depth you've had in your career and in your hobbies as well and what you've learned and self-taught and what degrees you may have. Like there's different ways of looking at it, but it would be useful if we could somehow test, measure, certify. Mm -hmm. Dustin, yes, you are a polymathic person. That is a skill set you bring to work Mm -hmm. or a skill set you carry with you throughout life. Because if we had that, it may lead to some strategic hiring opportunities or job placement um, that we could do in a, in a smarter way if we were able to certify it. Mm-hmm. So that would require some research to figure out like how to measure it, how to the typology for it. I know Michael Araki has, has done some work on creating um, an assessment for it. Um, but Yes. So, so that is something we, we need because right now it's just self-report. It's yeah, I'm polymathic. Yeah. Or I'm aspiring polymath. Yeah. Or an aspiring polymath. There is, I will say it's not out yet. Um, but there is a website coming out soon. I think that's called Polywork and Mm -hmm. it's similar to LinkedIn, but the concept is that it's for people who are talented in multiple areas. And instead of self-reporting, I'm a poly professional. Others I have worked with validate my different skill sets. And so LinkedIn is different because it basically is like, I'm good at this. And yeah, someone can give me like a, okay, she's good at communication or whatever. But this would be a more robust way of validating someone's multiple talents. Yeah. And there would be a clear, specific explicit focus on multiple talents instead of LinkedIn, which doesn't necessarily have any specific intention in that way. 
Well, and it's 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 literally just a line, so to speak, in LinkedIn. That's why I was making the sound there, because it's it, when you. One thing I talk about is personal branding. I think that's helpful for a lot of polymaths and polymathic people because then you can express the way you want to do it on your own right. And at that point, it's not really self-promoting or boasting because you're literally just talking about your life, essentially. But it is kind of still a little bit boastful because you're talking from yourself. If we could find some way to uh, do it communally of like, Mm -hmm. hey, you saying I had the skill and vice versa, kind of like what they had on LinkedIn, but something bigger, like Polyworks, I think, is trying to do there. That'd be interesting. I almost think that a blockchain platform would be useful for that. That decentralized approach would be very interesting. Yep, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. The wisdom of the crowd. Yeah. Yep. You've mentioned that your husband is an inspiration for you, uh, for your work, and you believe he's quite polymathic. What are some tell signs for you? You know, when I first met Joe, um, I loved that he he didn't sort of fit in a box. He was so intelligent and capable and constantly learning. Um, for example, like he's was an Eagle Scout as a as a boy, which is the highest level of Boy Scout. And it means basically he learned about lots of different like survival things and yeah. uh, that, that kind of thing. But he's also like really good at training animals and he could drive a snow plow and he could I don't know if we needed to figure out like just yesterday my printer wasn't working (laughs) and you know he's really good with technology and like figuring that out and totally self-taught at that too by the way like he can read something even very difficult and and understand it I will totally confess like whenever there is like a something we buy that need that has instructions (laughs) <laughs> where you have to assemble it. I give it to him because he's just really good at reading something and just grasping it, even if it's very technical. I'm good at reading things and grasping it, but not at everything, but mm-hmm. especially it's technical. speed too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, and we've done a lot, we've had various adventures. We've like, I don't know, we rode, uh, dual sport motorcycles for several years together before we had our daughter now motorcycles are a thing of the past um but we you know we did fun daring things we rode in a hot air balloon and took helicopter or flying lessons and you know i think we both just had this approach to want to try lots of fun things and learn and um but still be authentic to who we are Mm -hmm. and so yeah i think you know he uh he does those things which is great that's cool and Speaking of your daughter too, how was your journey of finishing your doctorate while going through an entire pregnancy and early motherhood? Yeah, no one's ever asked me that in an interview before. It gets passed over. Yes, so I, and I would not recommend necessarily what I did, although I wouldn't discourage it either for anyone. You know, I think we all have to decide what we're capable of Mm -hmm. of bearing and juggling or not. So yeah, I worked full time with a career in the federal government managed a family real estate business with a full-time doctoral student who finished my doctorate, including the dissertation in three years, which is the fastest possible time frame that can be done in. And I also had a baby. Oh, and my 95 year old grandfather, uh, my dying grandfather in his early to mid nineties, I was also watching over him. So mm-hmm. I had a massive amount of responsibility on my plate when I was writing my dissertation. Um, but my daughter was definitely a priority to me. Like she yeah. was the priority to me and, and still is. Um, so I'm not sure what else to say about that, except, you know, I did it. I survived it. <laughs> she's, you know, she's been a priority to me and will always be. And, uh, you know, we made it through a, a challenging time somehow. Right. Well, you <laughs> I didn't juggled. sleep much. Yeah. I guess sleep was the one that you had to give up at that point, but you juggled and hustled through it. I juggled and hustled through it. And honestly, can I be honest? Mm -hmm. Uh, When I look back at that period of my life, I feel so proud of what I was able to do because I know, and this is so arrogant of me to say, God, it's perfect for the show. It's fine. No worries. I know there aren't many people who could do what I did. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I think of what I was able to accomplish, and by the way, it's not just that I wrote a dissertation. It's that I wrote a dissertation that has resonated and been helpful to so many people too, which I never expected. I honestly expected I would write this dissertation, check a box, it'd sit in the ether or on a shelf and no human being on earth would read it because 
I didn't go around reading doctoral dissertations. I didn't realize people were open to that kind of thing. Yeah. But it has it has been found. And I've had people contact me from all over the world on a regular basis telling me it changed their lives. It saved their lives. It made them cry. Like mm -hmm. there is a real need and hunger people have to feel understood for being this way, which frankly is the natural way for human beings to be. Society has like pushed it out of us and, and forced us and coerced us to be narrow specialists. Um, but being a polymathic person approaching life in a, an open, curious, brave way is how we're supposed to be, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, and going to, um, a little bit on the neuroscience aspect, I do remember seeing some studies talking about how in the like ancient times, so to speak, there was a lot of specialists and polymathic people. And mm -hmm. that's the kind of point where there are some specialists in our society, but I think that the number is far, far lower than we think it is. And so like right now we have such a high number of specialists because we've forced it, but yep. it's actually much lower than that. And so we have a lot more polymaths too than we realize. Yeah, absolutely. We have so many closet polymaths. Yeah. Woo! People, <laughs> people um, hide and censor right. their polymathy. This is something I heard from my interviewees and my research is because it's not the default, the norm, the expectation. It's not what's most appreciated. The specialist path yeah. is all of those things. People censor and edit mm -hmm. their story, their brand to make their lives easier. I but have to too. I there understand. are, yep, they absolutely do. And it's sad, it's so sad that, that, that that's the case. But yes, I think there are a lot more people who, who actually have polymathic values and, and tend to live in that way, but may not even have a word for it. Mm -hmm. Like, don't even know the word polymath or don't even have some other synonym for it um, because we don't talk about this enough. Like, th there is beginning to be a shift with the books, and the podcasts, and the YouTube channel, like, and my dissertation and what you do. And there is a shift happening. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you, man, how many times I've talked about this and people go, oh, my God, I finally have a word. That's me. That's me. Thank yeah. you. So absolutely, 100%. There are many people who value and choose to live in a polymathic way, but don't identify it or have a word or explicitly have that as part of their brand because we just don't talk about it enough for that to happen. Right. And one thing you kind of alluded to at some points today is like, oh, I don't know if I should talk about this because it's, it's off topic. But the thing is, for this show, I... I try to make it in a way when I have guests to exemplify all those different areas because we don't yeah. know exactly what's off topic for a polymath. Yeah. Something that you think yeah. is off topic or I think is off topic might be perfect on topic for you connected yeah. to it and finding those connections is part, part of this. So I try to ask all those divergent questions for you. Yeah. And this is, I want to take what you just said and make another really important point is one of the things I heard from the polymaths I interviewed is that because they've had all this experience, all this knowledge, that it's really so much easier to find common ground with others. Because mm -hmm. you can find something in common. You can find, oh my God, you love, I don't know. What do you love, Dustin? Some, uh, graphic design. You love graphic design? Me too. Oh yeah. my God, let's talk about it. So um, that happens when you have polymathic people who have more options mm -hmm. to connect. What could that do for humanity if we were finding common ground with each other more and more, not based off of categories of identity that we had no say in? Mm -hmm. I had no say I was born female. I had no say I was born white. I had no say I was born American. We really put a lot of emphasis. And those categories matter. I don't mean to diminish yeah. them yeah. because they're a part of our identity and there are ramifications and right consequences for how we're treated in society based on those categories. So I'm not meaning to diminish it, but my point is I didn't pick any of those things. Yeah. What if in, what if we focused on the parts of our identity that we picked, that we love, that are passions in our heart and found ways to connect with other people and build bridges and find common ground based on that stuff. Mm -hmm. What could that do? What could that do for the way that that we connect 
I mean, especially in light of all the dissension and like division and like, ah, oh, just the vibe, the vibe in our world right now is really crappy. <laughs> um, right. You know, how could we shift and pivot to, instead of focusing on what makes us different, focusing on what makes us similar? Well, and this isn't polymathic, it's more of a jack of all trades thing, but I love kind of having that cocktail knowledge of many different areas as well. Mm -hmm. So that when I do approach someone new, I could talk to them about something that I may only know a little bit about, but I know just enough to be like, oh yeah, I'm educated in this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, something interesting I share, I'll share with you too. I haven't, um, I haven't spoken about this publicly, but I've really been thinking about it a lot Perfect. lately. So fascinating is there's a, a French scholar who's long dead. He wrote this book. Take, his first name was Teilhard. He wrote the book called Phenomenon of Man, which I'm still reading. Mm -hmm. But what this book talks about is what are the trends you see in evolution? If you look at evolution, like you're, you're, you're studying what evolution is and does, he argues there are two trends you see as evolution progresses in any species. One is higher individuation. So each agent, each creature you're looking at becomes more and more unique. Mm -hmm. There's more uniqueness that, that you see as a species evolves. And in addition to more individuation, he said that you also see more interconnectedness, more collaboration, more like we're each unique, but we're moving in this direction together. And I, I know this is super heady, so for just bear with me for a minute, but I feel like polymaths do that. That's what polymaths do. Polymaths individuate. Yeah. They become singular only expressions of who they are. Mm -hmm. They don't fit in the box. They don't become the cog in the wheel. They become unique, true versions of themselves. They individuate. Yeah. Maybe polymaths are part of what we're gonna, gonna do as we evolve. Maybe that's part of the process. That's what Teilhard would say. And then, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, before Poly Innovator, I created what I call the United Living Construct for that same purpose of connecting people together who are individualized, but in a way that we can create a hub of innovation, so to speak. Yes, hub of innovation, I love it. The second thing that Teilhard said in his book, The Phenomenon of Man, is <clears throat> that in addition to becoming more individuated at the individual level, is that you begin like a hive mind, you know, like bees or ants collaborating as a, a larger whole. Mm -hmm. And because of what we just talked about, where polymaths can find more ground, they can make connections, they can see the links, they can find something in common, you know, they can make those linkages, they can synthesize and build bridges. Is a polymathic approach part of what is necessary to get that sort of hive mind? Right. You need those connectors, you need those polymaths. So I would posit, because I believe what Teilhard said is accurate, that Polymaths are an expression of human evolution moving forward. Mm -hmm. That we need polymaths in order to evolve as a species and reach our collective potential. Well, and even like specialists need to have dual specialties now. I, I, when I created my spectrum, I almost didn't want to include specialists, but I realized that I need it for the comparison there, but also the fact that in the next 10 years, specialists are going to have to get more now, get expanded upon their one trench. It's, it's almost forceful now, like nanotechnology, biotech, uh, biopharmaceuticals. These are combination fields where you need two specialties. And so we're approaching that precipice where everybody has to have more than one specialty at this point. Yeah. No, I mean, we've been at innovation for a while, right? Mm. Especially with the advent of modern technology. Okay, so we've been at innovation for quite some time. And the innovations that we have have mm -hmm. Occur, that would have occurred within a single discipline have mostly been exhausted. Yeah. So now where do you innovate? Where else do we go? What else do we do? You make combinations at the intersection of disciplines or fields. And that's where you're going to get more of the payoff if you're looking for innovation. So absolutely. I think we need more and more of this, especially in the context of how many difficult problems humanity faces as a species. Mm-hmm. 
global warming, the yeah. pandemic, like everything really. Yes. I mean, there's so many problems we need to solve. We need to be strategic as a human collective. Yeah. About how can we solve this? How can we plan it? How can we build scaffolding and structures to support this so we can reach our potential? Well, when I created the United Living Construct, I actually thought of it in a way of creating the best individual first, helping educate them or educate themselves. And then that creates a good construct of society. And then you can build on top of that to build a global society. So it has to start from the person up. And that's something that I've been talking to people a lot about lately. And one thing to mention here is we love to get meta on this show. I know we have a time limit today, but beyond that, like I love those meta tangents. So I just want to, I just want to affirm like the, the, the thing you just said, like, what do you do first? What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you need the societal structures in place to help the individuals fall in line and reach their potential? Or does having, uh, you know, the individuals reach their potential and their capacities help build the structures that make the collective stronger? And that is a debate I don't have the answer to, okay. but I, t- I trend towards what you just said, is that if you start at the individual level, it will naturally build the scaffolding that you need for the collective potential to be realized. Well, and that's why I created the module degree, but I think it's interesting too, because I think we need both. I think we're so far behind now that we need both at the same time, and yep. we have to figure out how to do both. I completely, yes, I agree. I think it, it doesn't have to be either or. Can mm. we do both in tandem? And, uh, you know, I think this is an area worth definitely exploring. Game B, um, Jordan Greenhall and um, some others have really explored this. You should check out Game B. They're, they have a, a large Facebook group they, okay. where they explore these sorts of things. Uh, if you mention anything today, feel free to send it to me afterwards. Or I'll yes, yes, yes. Because I would love to have a lot of that. I already have a couple tabs open <laughs> to try to write down what you said. Because <laughs> otherwise, I'm, I'm making a note. I'll have to wait until I do the editing to remember. I tell you what, I forget so much. <clears throat> On a slightly different subject, but it's something I wanted to get in today too, is that one thing that's very prudent is to exemplify polymaths that aren't dead old white men. And yes. as there are some from all over the world, China, Arab uh, cultures, and of course, women polymaths as well. What are some great examples that you can think of? You know, I have given so much thought to this. I've wanted to write an article on like, who are what? some great polymaths that aren't dead white men Mm -hmm. and it's not so easy actually it's not so easy still you know i I think marie curie oprah winfrey there are i mean there are some women who have accomplished and women of color or men of color um who have accomplished great things but there's a real gap still i wish i wish i could give you a long list of like oh here are all the polymaths that are not dead white men Mm -hmm. but they still dom white men still dominate who is considered polymathic. So well, I, I don't have a good answer. I noticed some out there, like, I don't remember her name off the top of my head. Which I was actually looking for this person when I made your question. She helped found the modern idea of a computer. And the way she approached mathematics and science was very polymathic. And I wanted yeah. to simplify her. Uh, I I can't remember her name. Hedy right Lamar? Oh, no, I don't know. It, this was like a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, something like that. And so I, I'll have to think about it and mention it later, but she's a prime example. And there's other people too. That's kind of the point where I can't remember her name because she hasn't been yeah, that's pushed down point. my throat as much. Um, yeah, because we don't talk about them. Mm-hmm. I mean, we think of Elon Musk. You Even know, then, we- like, I have a feeling that Elon is polymathic, but I wouldn't consider him a polymath. I don't a know. polymath. That's a good distinction, polymathic versus a polymath. Yeah, I mean, I actually, you know, you know who I think is a cool polymath? I mean, not that he changed the world or anything, but Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. He's never he's not never talked about as being a polymath, but damn, he is. He had a bodybuilding career, super successful, an acting career, super successful, a business career, super successful, and a political career. Yeah. Like he is a friggin' polymath. Kevin Hart's another good example too. Yeah. Oh, he's such a businessman. Yeah. An entertainer. Yep. Uh, Tim Ferriss interviewed him. If you haven't seen that interview, that was really cool. So we both aspire to make polymathic individuals feel seen and heard. Uh, yeah. I even mentioned how your dissertation has helped people with that earlier. It also is the reason why I do a lot of these interviews. I even try to make sure I diversify my guest list. And so I have people with different backgrounds and shapes and sizes and types and all that good stuff. Yep. But not only to exemplify the polymathic traits of my guests, but to give a voice for the people listening in. How do you think that we both, or 
even though we're on different paths, can continue to unite multidisciplinary across the world. Yeah, I think having conversations like this, and can I just say, mm-hmm. so I've, I've been at this for five years. I started my dissertation in 2015. It's now 2020. Some other thinkers in the field feel like competitors. The vibe they give off, like, you know, I reach out, hey, can we connect? Can we talk? No response. Send it again. No response. Like some, and I'm not, I will not name any names here, but some of the thought leaders in this arena compete. Mm -hmm. And some of us collaborate and support like this. So that's part of what I think we should be doing. If we really care about this concept and we want to support people, let's harness our collective capacities and support one another rather than being competitive. Yeah. You know, what's something super serendipitous in a way. It's super interesting. Last night when I was reading some, and watching some of your stuff and also taking into some other accounts, some other polymathic people, I had a, what's it's kind of like a eureka moment in a way where i was like okay i need to record a micro polycast real quick because so i do these micro episodes that are three oh, to nice. nine minutes long too and this is about competition now mm. peter thiel famous uh, venture capitalist entrepreneur and all that good stuff he mm. i don't remember exactly what he said he said polymaster are dead and i thought that was not true but that's a whole other point that i wanted to just throw out there but the main point i want to make is that he talks about competition is for losers because competition stifles innovation for the most part. Like, sure, people try to iterate because of it, but it doesn't actually conduce it. It's collaboration that really gets that innovation. And that concept made me think about what you just said there. There are people in this space that I haven't had any negative issues per se when it comes to people saying no to me for it. If they said no to me, it was more of like my metrics are too low. <clears throat> I have too little, too little followers, something like that. And even then I kind of get that because they're super busy and like I've had multinational CEOs on the show and stuff like that. So I get that persona, but collaboration is key. If we want to, I literally created this last night. I need to upload it. But um, if we want to pursue this if, as creators of this content, of this mm-hmm. kind of space, we need to collaborate because it's actually yeah. better for us to do so. And in the long run, more will come out of it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing is, if you think about it, I mean, I'm like psychoanalyzing people who compete in this space, but if you're really secure and confident in what you can add, Mm -hmm. you don't need to compete. You can praise other people's work, give credit, reference, talk about what other people have done, encourage people to check it out on their own and find what fits for them. It's a sign of insecurity when you're like, no, 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 don't pay attention to those people. Just look at my stuff. Right. It's interesting too, because uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm putting all those links in my posts for like those, that mini series I'm making. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if you look at it from a search engine optimization standpoint, if someone clicks any one of those links, they're leaving my site, which could mean, sure, it makes me more of a thought leader in Google's eyes, but it's also like, hey, they're leaving my site, which means what's over there is more interesting than there. So I'm actually going to rank worse, presumably, because of that. But I'd rather have that sacrifice and make sure people can see all the stuff that's online about polymathy. That's more important. Yeah, it just feels right, like the right thing to do. I mean, in the context of people feeling alone, people feeling misunderstood, not appreciated, like if providing them lots of resources and options to see that they're not alone, they're not underappreciated, you know, Mm -hmm. if that helps them like have their own epiphanies and, and realizations about their identity and maybe newfound appreciation for who they are, acceptance of who they are. If my Google ranking is lower, (laughs) whatever, (laughs) like I'll take helping a human being over like, my online ranking their gratitude might actually be more important than the ranking anyways too this is something that gary v talks a lot about too is making sure you build people up and in the long run uh, if you believe in karma they'll come back to you so to speak yeah it's the right thing to do people feeling not like themselves or not feeling misunderstood kind of leads me to this question too what are some ways to combat the imposter syndrome then that we face as these polymathic people yeah, the imposter syndrome that came up in my research Yeah, that I, I did not expect it. I didn't ask a single question about imposter syndrome. And like, I don't know, a third or a half of my interviewees brought it up on their own, which was, I guess it shouldn't have been surprising, but I just didn't think it would, I didn't think about Considering it. Considering our society though. 
Yeah, I mean, in an age of specialization, I, I, I don't think polymaths innately should feel imposter. They shouldn't. That's my judgment. I don't think they should feel imposter syndrome because they're intelligent, capable, brave, curious people. They're wonderful people living life on their own terms, outside the box, like embracing and uh, you know going all in at life itself, being very open to experiences. It's a wonderful, like, why should those people feel bad or like they're imposters? Actually, maybe this, I just had a thought, maybe it's the specialists who should feel like imposters. You know why? Because that's not a natural way of being. Yeah. It's not a natural way to be that way. Well, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that because you know what? We need specialists. We need specialists. We need a mix. So yeah. I don't mean to demean the value that, that they bring, but there is a certain, a certain element in my view that like being hyper, hyper focused with blinders on is not exactly the natural human tendency. I think T-shaped. That's why I added on my spectrum too. The T-shape is crucial. Yeah. That's more natural. Being curious about many things, you don't have to go that deep into them, but just having a wide range of cocktail knowledge. But if you want to, and if you want to have a specialist, if you want to be a specialist and be T-shaped or be like a multidisciplinary person with multiple pillars, so to speak. Yeah. Like an H. That's a, mm -hmm. I kind of think of at least a, a a polymath with like two two different sorts of focuses would be like an H and you can connect them. But that's kind um, of interesting because I think that polymaths require at least three areas of expertise. That's another debate. That's yeah. another debate. How much? How many different? How expert? How accomplished? Yeah. Well, and when it comes to competency, meaning like expert versus master, that's why I did the whole true polymath versus polymath, or some people say ultimate polymath, like Leonardo da Vinci, so to speak. And that's someone who is like a master level in many different areas. But I think that's, that's a little too far out of reach right now for most people. And most yeah. people don't really want that. Some people who are polymathic do, and they need to master time management and self-awareness and um, all these different intrapersonal diversity aspects as well. It, that's for that part. But I think for most people, being a trimath or a bimath or someone who's kind of in the Renaissance mode, well, not super competent in super many areas, but pretty adept in many areas. I think that's yeah. perfectly fine as well. I think there's risk in defining polymathy too narrowly. I mean, it's sort of ironic to define a term that means like being lots of things and then trying to put it in a box and, uh, you know, constrict what it could mean. I think there's a lot of value in having, you know, this understanding that it's a range, there's mm -hmm. breadth, there's depth, integration, as Michael Araki talks about quite a bit, you know, you know, being able to do analogical thinking and innovate because of the integration aspect. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's, it's dangerous to define polymathy too narrowly. Mm -hmm. Because if polymathy is only Leonardo da Vinci and it's only you're highly expert in three things at the same time, then what that will do, I think, is discourage real people from even trying because they'll say, oh, I, uh, that's too much, too arduous. I can't do that. And what I would like to encourage people to do okay. is to just be open to be more polymathic, to trend in that way, to adopt some of these values um, to not expect Leonardo level yeah. creative genius, eminent contributions, but just see how you can open up to experiences a bit more, see how you can self direct your own learning journey a little bit more and, and do it on your own terms in a way that feels comfortable and rewarding for you rather than someone imposing what the word polymath means and then it's too elite elitist and, and you can't participate in that yeah and so the definitions i had mentioned there i'm not trying to cut anybody out of that i just thought the true polymath would be a good aspiration tool uh -huh. uh, and then like the polymath term being more realistic because like at this point too I think Peter Thiel's point when he said polymaths are dead is that it's too hard to master anything nowadays because there's so many fields that are changing so rapidly and there's way more fields. Renaissance men wanted to know everything. Well, now the term everything has changed drastically. Yeah. We have so many new areas of science and stuff like that. I don't think it's impossible to be polymath nowadays. And I think you might agree. It's obviously a natural state for many people. But Yeah. I mean, I think a key distinction is you could view polymath in terms of tell me what you know. Tell me what you've done. Mm -hmm. And you know what? What you knew and what you've done may soon become outdated and irrelevant. Because mm -hmm. as you said, we're in a fast-paced society where things are changing. You know? So 
that's one measure of it, one way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it that I think is much more useful is looking at polymathy like it's a way of being and thinking and going through life that involves curiosity, self-directed lifelong learning, bravery, openness, those elements. So no matter what you know or what you've done, like you can have those qualities I just described and be polymathic mm -hmm. based on kind of an approach to living and learning rather than the specifics of what you've lived and learned. You know yeah. what I mean? Kind of thing in more glass half like empty that you can fill up with more versus ha glass half full like what do you already have in there or yeah or just sort of a disposition and approach mm -hmm. versus the nitty-gritty mm -hmm. of what you've done you know more what macro I mean? yeah yeah it's interesting too because multi-potentialite is a word that a lot of people identify as and i think that's one reason why it's gotten so popular is that it was able to i kind of get the why the story elements connect with people's personal like this is what i aspire to be so to speak i want to be curious i want to be that kind of person that's that's who i identify as but polymath mm -hmm. hasn't had that ability yet people think it's too ethereal in a way despite the it, fact it's much more tangible yeah it's not the best word i i mean it's the best word in my view that we have to describe this concept i am not a fan of the word multi-potentialite as you know because basically what it says is you have lots of multiple potentials. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've actually done anything with your potential. And isn't that kind of the point? Like, yeah. isn't the point to like live well and try and learn and have experiences, uh, you know, multi potential, you could be a, a multi potentialite and, you know, be a bump on a log and never do anything. <laughs> Right. So polymath sort of implies like you've actually done something you've you've learned you've experienced some would would argue that you could you could have a polymathic personality and still not be accomplished. Mm -hmm. That's more research that needs to get done. Like, is there a general disposition, a general personality trait for polymathy? Some might say it's ADHD, by the way, I'm yeah. having a conversation with a Stanford guy later today. Um, on that because he he thinks he's like tell me about tell me about polymathy and then I describe all and he's like sounds like my ADHD mm. what's that, the difference between ADHD and polymathy I've been seeing some similar things too like some some of my guests have identified or been told that are ADHD yeah. and yep. not all of them like only a, fra a handful of them but they even some neuroscientists are even labeling Leonardo da Vinci as ADHD which posthumously, I don't think is a great idea to try to identify something like that with such someone, even for someone that of that caliber. But regardless, it is interesting. And maybe that it's not that we are mystifying polymaths. Maybe it's mystifying ADHD patients. Maybe they're not attention deficit. Maybe they're just multi-potentialized. Really curious. <laughs> yeah, really curious. curious. Yeah. Hungry, hungry for information. Yeah, I, and this is an area I hope to explore more. Um, it's just interesting to... It, more research needs to be done. Like, is there a difference between polymaths and people with ADHD? Because I also have had many people who are like, I'm polymath. And oh, by the way, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. It's happened, you know, many, many polymathic types have told me that. But, but just back to circle back to the point about mm -hmm. the word and how we label it and how we think of it. Polymath is a clunky word. When I first found it, I remember when I was beginning my research, by the way, I, I, I was like, I want to study Renaissance people. That's how I thought of it originally. I want to study Renaissance men and women because that's what I wanted to be like. That was how I labeled it for myself mm -hmm. for a very long time. I want to be a Renaissance woman. And I remember like Googling synonyms for Renaissance man. And I kept seeing polymath and I kept going, I have never heard that word ever. So I refuse to use it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows it. Why would I use a word? Nobody knows. But I kept hunting for the right term and just couldn't find it. So I resorted to polymath because it was technically the correct single mm -hmm. word. We have yeah. other phrases. Like generalized. But I wanted a single word. Or like general phrases. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, jack of all trades, even though I don't like that one, or homo universalis, or. Mm -hmm. uh, Why don't you know, like jack? Jack of all trades. It has this connotation with the master of none and polymath. I mean, I guess it's sort of on the spectrum somewhere along with polymathy. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. So it's I mean, also not a single word. Yeah. 
Well, that's true. Uh, Jack of all trades, master of none, but also sometimes better than a master of one. Yeah. And, if you finish it that way, then I like it better. <laughs> but, and that's the problem. Like, for some reason, society cut off that second half. So that's yes! One, that's one reason why Fine. I... I don't know. I think it's because they wanted, well, because of the industrial revolution, people wanted to be specialists. They wanted people to be cogs in the wheel. Yep. Um, well, and that's one reason why I kept it. Like I could just drop Jack of all trades and just keep, make a polymath spectrum without it. But I think by changing people's perception on that phrase there, it'll help polymathy in the long run by proxy. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I like your idea of having uh, what you showed me earlier today before this recording started this sort of spectrum with different terms and sort of where they would appear in relation to one another. I think that's a great idea because having choice is a good thing. Having mm -hmm. words is generally a good thing to attach to your identity and gain self-awareness. Although I will say one point I, and I have made this point before is polymaths are very used to not fitting into categories. They defy categorization. They, right have elements of their personality that people think don't go together. Like, yeah. can you really be a tattooed magician, PhD physics professor? Yes, you can. That happens yeah. to be somebody I interviewed. Right. Um, so they're used to defying categories. So calling them this one word, like that's supposed to be an umbrella to capture everything, can feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm unusual for a pol for a polymathic person to finally have this term that sort of summarizes their essence. Yeah. It's weird for them sometimes. Well, and I don't know if you noticed, but one of the terms I put on that spectrum was a niche polymath. Yeah. So one thing I'm noticing is that there's a lot of people who are not polymaths in the sense of divergent areas of like having multidisciplinarity, like in many different fields that are separate, a desperate, disparate uh, fields. Mm -hmm but they're more of like adjacent fields, which I think so, like Iraqi's yeah. thing talks about a little bit to um, like, not Ami um, genre, but something similar to that mm -hmm. where they're, they're similar together. And so for example, poly innovator is a polymath of innovation. I consider that a niche pol uh, polymath because I want to be more in the innovation fields. Granted yeah. polymaths are naturally innovative, but that's why it works together. Yeah. But the thing is, it's not a polymath of many different areas, so to speak. I just want to innovate in these fields. That's what I care about most is innovation. It's, yeah. I don't know why, but that's what I'm obsessed with. And so other yes. people are obsessed with like, oh, I just wanted to create. So polymathic creation or something like that. These kind of niched ideas in a way. Yeah, but I think you're right. I mean, when we think about how the typologies that could exist or the, the, the different terms or the ranges, there's definitely like people who, who have multiple skills in adjacent fields. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who have skills in not so adjacent fields and like their qualities are maybe a little bit different and their abilities are different. And so um, it would be wonderful if at some point in the future we had more robust study and understanding and labels to, to understand these different options about how being a poly person can show up. Poly person. I like that. <laughs> a poly uh. professional. Poly professional. Look at that. We're making terms already. You could have so much fun. Put poly and then just something else. Okay. So have you seen my website? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's okay. what you do. You already poly do that. Poly innovator, poly pro, <laughs> poly cast. I, I actually had poly blog, but I was like, this is too many poly. Someone even said that. And I was like, I, you know what? I agree. So I made it omni blog because my, my blog is omni, like uh, omni genre. I talk about everything, so to speak. Yes. So like omni like blog it. makes sense but I have Polly in front of everything. It's, it's actually kind of funny. Honestly, I love it. Polly Dustin. <laughs> um, oh, there was, there was something else that I put Polly in front of that was like that. It was funny. I can't remember off the top of my head. So something related to you mentioned here about people of our kind, not really wanting to fit inside a box. How can we break outside the box more? Yeah. I think the more that we do it, the more other people will feel comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. Like lead the way. make, make up your own rules. Like yeah. if, you know, make up your own hodgepodge combination of, of who you are. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I really love this way of being, can I just say, like, growing up, there were multiple elements of my identity that weren't supposed to go together. I'll share a little bit with you. Like, I was born in Berkeley, California, which is like the liberal hippie Mecca, right? right? And yet, 
you know, my grandparents who raised me put me in private Christian schools, very conservative. So I was in this world where it's like, it's liberal here and it's conservative here and I can sort of get both and see the pros and cons of both. Um, another example is my mother was a Cuba, or is a Cuban immigrant. Mm -hmm. And my dad was, you know, born in California, raised in California. And so I had like, you know, these two cultures sort of coming together. Um, I grew up in a household with three generations, my grandparents, my dad, and my two older brothers. And so I felt sort of, even though I'm of this generation, like I'm exposed regularly to people from other generations. Also, I'm female, mm -hmm. pretty stereotypically female not completely, but in a lot of ways. I like fashion and makeup. Perfume. And, and perfume, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and coffee talk with my girlfriends. Um, but I grew up in a household that was dominated by males. My, my grandpa, my dad, two brothers, it was just me and my grandma were the only, only females in our household. And it just, I mean, there were, it was very common for me in high school to hang out I, before, especially before I could drive. Mm -hmm. I would hang out with my older brother, Paul, who's a very close friend and all his guy friends. Like I would be the little sister tagging along with my older brother and all his like male teenage friends. And so I just felt very comfortable, like hanging out with the guys, even though I'm this like girly girl kind of. So those are just a few examples, like early on in my life, I was just used to like duality. Like I could be this and this even though maybe that's not very common. And so I liked that about myself. And to this day, still strive to, to be many things. Walt Whitman said, I am large, I contain, or do I contradict myself? Okay, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Mm -hmm. And that's how I wanna be. I don't want to just, narrow down who I am or who I could become because that's what other people do. Right. I want to be who I am in all of my facets. And so if that means I ride motorcycles and work for presidents and have my tongue pierced and write books and do all the things that sound like they shouldn't go together. So be it. Then so be it. I love that about my own identity. Is that arrogant that I just said that? I want to be lots of things. I want to be all the things that feel true to me. So I'm okay with you being arrogant. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> and I think it'd be one of those things too, where if you can get more, like a little bit more arrogant, so to speak, you'll have the confidence to be more open in the show. So I think that's good for me there. That's all good. There you go. <laughs> um, I actually took note of this. I didn't know about, I didn't have, find a way to fit into the show, but in terms of family, we both come from a multicultural family background. Uh, your mother was Cuban immigrants. My father and stepfather were Mexican to some degree. And so I have native Mexican and, and Spain Spanish in my blood, as well as we both have European descent, German, French, Irish, English, kind of a tiny bit oh, of Native awesome. American thrown in. We both have that. I took a DNA Maybe test. we're related. <laughs> um, go on Ancestry. <laughs> go, on, go on Ancestry and see if we have a, you know what? I might go on there and just see you like 10 lines down. <laughs> Who knows? Funny. Maybe we're like distant, like eighth cousins or something. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny. Like I had a lot of matches on there. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Oh, I love that stuff. So kind of going back to some of the questions here, how does polymathy impact creativity and creative problem solving? Well, we've touched upon a bit of this, but mm -hmm. just to kind of affirm, a lot of the innovations that would have occurred within disciplines have been done where the payoffs are now is at the intersection of disciplines. And if you're talking about the intersection of disciplines, you're talking about polymaths. Mm -hmm. At least if you're looking for a single individual. Now you can innovate on teams. You can depend on different people to collaborate together at the intersection, but there are costs and downsides of that. And here's another important point I like to make that I probably haven't done enough. When you depend on different people to collaborate together, on any given subject. They necessarily must use language. They must communicate in order to collaborate at that intersection, right? Right. Language is a hurdle. Yeah. It's a tool that is limited and sometimes things get lost in translation. And particularly if you're talking about people working in different fields meeting at that intersection, they may speak different professional languages even, which makes this problem even more difficult. 
the benefit of a polymath who can speak those languages yeah. is that, that they don't need language necessarily. They don't need the roadblock and the hurdle of language in order to have flashes of insight and innovation and creativity. They can have pre-verbal pre thoughts mm -hmm. and see insights in their own mind without having to cross this arduous bridge language to another person's mind. I see what that, I'm saying? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think another point to make, though, is the polymaths often have that language, though. Like I mentioned earlier, the whole cocktail party knowledge, that's mm -hmm. useful for a translation like that. Like if I'm trying to talk to a coder and the designer, which I see a lot of project managers exemplifying a lot mm -hmm. of polymathic traits because mm -hmm. they have to. They have to have knowledge in many different areas. That's one of the few polymathic kind of jobs that are out there. Uh, yeah. Although there's plenty of project managers who aren't polymaths. And I think that they're not usually as good at their job because of it. Because you need to be able mm -hmm. to take point A and explain it to point B and vice versa. And then yeah. be able to explain it to the businessman on top of them. Exactly. Polymaths are well suited to project management roles. Some polymaths, not all, well suited to leadership roles because mm -hmm. if they're managing a diverse group with different backgrounds, being a polymath themselves could be very useful in that. You know, this is another area for future study, by the way, like specifically what roles and industries are polymaths well suited to. And I think project management, like you mentioned, That's is one of them for sure. No, I didn't mean to rush you there. I was just, I, I was trying to think about that more, what you were saying while I was listening in. It's like, what roles could be for that? That is a very interesting thought. I know that I've taken career tests and I know other people who have been on the show. Solutions Architect is another one I see cropping up a lot. So that was yeah. one thing that popped up. But yeah, that is interesting too. And you mentioned leadership. What do you think it may take to have a polymathic leadership? The way I view a, a, a polymath as a leader is they're kind of a hub mm -hmm. of, of connectivity um, rather than being a hierarchy where the leaders are on top and like you got people flowing down from there, a polymathic leader, you flatten it and you make them like the center of a hub with, with people sort of connecting out, you know, out, out uh, flat, I guess. Yeah. Um, and they, they harness like like a neural network like if you imagine like how a neural network looks um you know there are these hubs of connectivity with neurons and dendrites and all these things that sort of flow out from there and i really think polymaths are well suited to that hub role because they're good at uh you know understanding multiple functions they're good at connecting the dots they have lots of tools in their toolkit. So to put a polymath in a role that's not a hub of connectivity and creativity and to put them in a, a source more sort of a boxed in limited role with maybe only limited connectivity to other functions, I think is underutilizing their capacity. Yeah. No, and it's interesting too, because once again, project manager comes to mind for that hub, so to speak. Yes. Another th term actually comes to mind is super connector. I don't remember mm -hmm. what the what book is based off of, but um, one of my first guests brought that term at to my attention. And it seems like a lot of polymathic people are super connectors, especially the more extroverted ones as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love that idea, super connector. And that's another great point too, is like there, there is a qual, I don't, I don't have the data mm -hmm. for this. But just based on the people I interviewed as part of my doctoral research, there is a sort of qualitative difference I felt between the very extroverted polymaths and the more introverted polymaths. Mm -hmm. Like the kinds of roles that each of them would be appropriate for would be different. One of the guys I interviewed, he's like a coder and an artist and he, he was a serial entrepreneur. He could not work for other people. And he really didn't want to work with other people much. So if you stick that guy in a leadership role, he would probably fall on his face and, and not right. do very well. So, but there are other polymaths who love people and love being that hub and really extroverted. And not that extroversion or introversion is a measure of leadership capacity, because surely there are plenty of leaders who are actually introverted and quite mm -hmm. competent and excellent oh, yeah. as leaders. So I'm not meaning to apply that, but this is an, another area for future study is sort of figuring out like, okay, what types of polymaths exist and what types of professions or roles 
are suited to them based on the, the types of qualities that they have. And the introversion, extroversion one is one of those uh, qualities, I think, that would be interesting to study. So something you said just now kind of contradicted something you said earlier, where we don't want to define the polymath too much because then it kind of limits them. But then we also need to identify types, which means yeah. it requires definition. That's kind of a, <laughs> it's, it's a paradox that you and I both are thinking are coming across here quite a bit. It, it sucks because like, we have to, but we also don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to embrace paradox in this world. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think we need understanding, we need options, we need labels to mm -hmm. understand. At the same time, we don't want to box people in. So maybe having labels and options and understanding, you know, allows people to have a menu and they can say, oh, I'm not, I'm not like that one, but yes, I'm like that one. Um, they can sort of gain self-awareness by having sort of this menu of options. Right. Well, if oh. you want, we could meet here. Okay. So something that kind of relates to what we were just talking about too is the someone asked you about this importance. I don't remember what show about the importance of extroversion and in, extra introversion, introversion and extroversion. Yes. And I would even add ambiversion in there as well mm -hmm. to polymathy. Yeah. However, it wasn't the purpose of your research, and so you didn't spend too much time on it, obviously. And I thought about it too, and it seems like there's personalities for polymaths of all types, but it doesn't seem to be a strong correlation to whether or not people are becoming polymaths. Just that when you look at it from a genius perspective, mm -hmm. if they're contributing to society or if they're considered a genius, that kind of thing, such as Nikola Tesla or Benjamin Franklin or even Mary Somerville, there's a distinction of whether or not they are successful by mm -hmm. whether or not they, how well they were able to work with others. So what are your thoughts on that? It's a long question, I know. Yeah, that's a great question. To Basically what I'm hearing is, to what extent do you need to be able to collaborate with other people to be successful? Mm -hmm. That is especially a deep as a question, yeah. uh, especially as a polymath. I mean, I feel like if you're able to collaborate with others, it certainly does position you better to sort of spread your wings and, and latch onto other people and use your collective force for mm -hmm. good. So there is definitely value in being able to collaborate with others. Now, could an individual still reach their full potential on their own, like without professionally collaborating. I mean, I think if that's how someone's oriented, they could step into their potential without being a, a great collaborator. Sure. I think it's possible. But I think that like, for example, Nikola Tesla tried to collaborate with people and he ended up getting kind of screwed over. And so he stopped, once he got screwed over once, he stopped connecting with anybody. And because <laughs> yeah. of that, his intelligence was basically wasted on society, even though he was a polymath. And so I was just thinking that if we could find some other people that are good examples of like be good models. Yeah, I think the ideal is to harness our collective intelligence, including polymathic types, and certainly being able to work well with others yeah. um, helps to reach our collective and perhaps individual potential in some cases. So I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to strive for and try for to the extent it feels comfortable and, and authentic to an individual. I like that. And so you, you're writing a book at the moment. What is it about and what do you hope people to get from that? Yes, I just finished my last uh, chapter about a week ago. It's a nice. book that's going to be coming out next year through Business Expert Press called Polymaths and the Business Organization. And I'm mm. co-writing it with actually one of, one of, when you write a dissertation, you have a, what's called a committee. So you have a chair and then you have a couple people with doctorates on your committee and they sort of advise and guide, guide you as you do your research. And so one of my committee members had approached me earlier this year to co-author a book with him because he just loves this topic. He sees what a hot topic it is. And yeah, yeah so we're co-writing a book and it's really about polymaths in the business context because mm. their business leaders really, really need to think strategically about this stuff more in the future. I mean, it's sort of off their radar and a missed opportunity. So that's right. what the book is about. Um, that's fantastic. I'm looking forward to reading that. That also made me think maybe you should make like a LinkedIn course based off the book. Yeah. Oh, it's kind so funny cool. you mentioned courses because I've been thinking more and more like, what do I really want to do with this polymath stuff? You mm -hmm. know, I'm considered a world expert in it and I've got my YouTube channel and I've got the Facebook group, but what do I really want to do with this? And some courses is something I'm definitely thinking about. It's an area I'm well knowledge knowledgeable in. So maybe we could talk about that next time I have Ooh, you on. There we go. That sounds great. Yeah. And so where can people find you online? 
You can find me on, uh, well, on YouTube on Polymath's Place. You can find my group on Facebook, Polymath's Place. You can find me on LinkedIn under Angela Cotalesa, or you can email me at Angela at Polymath's Place, no apostrophe in that one, polymathsplace.com. Yeah, so, and, and someday when I get my act together, you can find me at polymassplace.com, but yeah. I don't yet, <laughs> and I guess you can find me at lessoncollector.com, but that's sort of a different uh, focus. I think I do have lesson collector in the list. I have a list of links here that I'll put in the description for people, including your book okay. and your dissertation. I mean, um, what is the call to action besides contacting you and start learning about your stuff for the audience today? My call to action is to be open, try new things, live life on your own terms, Learn as much as you can, contribute as much as you can while you're here. Mm -hmm. Be brave, be curious, be all in at life. Yeah, all in. Once again, there we go. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Lessa. Dr. Lessa. Yeah, that's <laughs> what my brother calls me. Oh, I want to mention too, for anyone who wants to read my dissertation, if you go to researchgate.com, you can find it, or if you just Google in pursuit of polymaths, you can find it for free digitally. If you want a hard printed copy, go to amazon.com. You can find it there. I also created a journal for polymathic people that's available on Amazon or mm. and t-shirts. Perfect. People had asked me for t you go to Amazon, you can find some polymass place t-shirts too. I have research gate and Amazon already in the description for people. So don't worry. Awesome. You're on top Perfect. of it. I'm yeah. impressed. Thank you. And so once again, this is Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator and Dr. Angela Contalesa on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you. Bye everyone. Uh